Hello to you. I do hope you're well and welcome to this GCSE RE revision session. I'm Ben Waddle and today we are talking all things theme B, religion and life for the AQA paper two, the thematic study. So let's take a look at what we're going to be taking a look at today, shall we? So here are all the topics that could be on the theme B section of the exam. So we've got origins of the universe, origins of human life, the value of the world, and that's where we'll talk about stewardship and dominion and responses to pollution, for example. We've got animal experimentation, which is a contrasting beliefs topic. That's where I've colour coordinated it in purple. Uh, we'll talk about the sanctity and quality of life. We'll talk about abortion and euthanasia, which are also contrasting beliefs topics. And then we'll conclude by having a look at life after death. So these are all the topics that could be on the theme B section talking about religion and life. And I thought we could start off with a couple of key quotes that I think really set the scene, if you like, for theme B. Uh, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the Christian and Islamic views on all of these issues. So we've got a great quote here from Pope Francis. Let us be protectors of God's creation. A fantastic quote about contemporary stewardship for Christians. We've got God gave you life from Surah. Two, which is a fantastic quote in terms of your Islamic beliefs about several of these topics, for example, abortion, euthanasia and the sanctity of life. Series 71 has a fantastic line. It says, he created you stage by stage. And in theme B, we talk a lot about the relationship between religion and science. And some key thinkers suggest this shows compatibility between the Quran and evolution. The idea God created humanity stage by stage, they have suggested, is very much in line with evolution and that process of gradual adaptation. Uh, and then we've got Genesis 1.26, that classic quote in the image of God, he created them, that key doctrine, Imago Dei, that is so important in Christianity, again, when we're talking about the sanctity of life. Whoever has killed a soul, it is as though he has killed all mankind, is a great quote from Surah 7, talking about, again, the sanctity of life, and then we'll link that in with abortion and euthanasia. Surah 39 has another great quote, God is the creator of all things, a fantastic quote when you're talking about the origins of the universe and human life, for example. In Colossians, one of St. Paul's letters, we read, clothe yourselves with compassion. This is a really good um, point to make when you're talking about euthanasia, for example, the idea of considering what is the most loving or what is the most compassionate thing to do as a really important Christian ethical approach. Uh, God is the creator of all things. Oh, I've put that one twice. Do excuse me, guys. It's that important. I've put that quote twice. There you go. It's really important to remember. Surah 39 again. Do excuse me. Oh, dear. A slight technical issue there. Never mind. Let's move swiftly on. We've got Isaac Newton here saying that gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot explain who sets the planets in motion. Now, I love this quote because it really brings to light this conversation between religion and science. The idea from many thinkers that whilst religion explains um, why the universe exists, that science explains how it came into existence. And this leads me on to this quote here from Pope Francis. And he says, the Big Bang Theory, which is proposed today as the origin of the world, does not contradict the intervention of a divine creator, but depends on it. And again, this key conversation in theme B about the relationship between religion and science. Pope Francis here saying that religion and science are not in contradiction, but actually they are very compatible because the Big Bang Theory does not disprove God's existence, but actually demonstrates why God must exist. It proves God must exist. And he goes on to say evolution in nature does not conflict with the notion of creation because evolution presupposes the creation of beings who evolve. Now, one man who would passionately disagree with Pope Francis is Richard Dawkins, the author of a book called The God Delusion. But what Pope Francis is saying here, and this is really important in terms of our religious responses to science, is that religion and science are complementary rather than in conflict. And a fun fact for you, Pope Francis used to be a chemist very, very early on in his life, really, again, illustrating that there may not be a conflict or contradiction between religion and science. So 
Before we get into the key content that we've just had a look at there, I wanted to start with a quick run through of your key terms. Now, obviously, these are really important for question one when you've got to identify the definitions, but it's also really important to know your key terms for questions one, two, three, four, and five. So let's just talk through them so we are absolutely confident and so we can go into that exam and get our grade nine. So abortion, our first key term, it's the deliberate ending of a pregnancy. Afterlife is beliefs about what happens to us after our body has died. Now in many religions, this relates to life after death or immortality. So that's the idea of living forever in some form. Now, whether obviously that's physical or spiritual, you know, we can have a discussion about but afterlife is the idea your life will continue or you will continue after your physical death. Animal experimentation, one of our contrasting beliefs topics, is the use of animals for medical research and product testing. Now, that's a really important distinction that we're going to come back to later. You know, different attitudes to medical testing for life-saving treatments compared with cosmetics testings for mascaras and, you know, for beauty companies to make money by killing animals as they create their products. Or in wonder is the sense of wonderment at nature, often linked to the feeling that God is involved or revealed through it, a great link to theme C there. Uh, Big Bang Theory is a scientific theory about the origins of the universe, the belief that the universe began almost 14 billion, I think it's 13.8 billion to be a little bit more exact, 14 billion years ago with a reaction of particles from a singularity followed by a process of inflation and expansion. And uh, scientists tell us it is continuing to expand today. What's it expanding into? I always wonder, just a little philosophical thought for us. Death then is the end of the physical bodily life. Dominion is the belief that humans have been given control or charge of the world. The environment is the world around us. This can be made up of uh, natural or artificial surroundings. Euthanasia, this is assisting with the end of life for a person who is terminally ill or who has a degenerative illness. It's often known as assisted suicide. Again, another uh, contrasting beliefs topic. Evolution is the scientific theory of the development of species, which involves the process of natural selection and survival of the fittest. Natural resources are resources which are found in nature, fossil fuels such as coal, oil and natural gas and also plants, etc. And we'll talk about how religious people feel about the use of natural resources, which are, of course, finite. Pollution is the contamination of an environment with harmful substances. And we're going to look at Christian and Islamic responses to the problem of pollution. You know, we're going to talk about what they believe about it. And also, most importantly, what they do about it, the practical responses. Quality of life, then a really important secular concept. It is the standard of health, comfort and happiness slash fulfillment experienced by a person or group. This is something very subjective and subject to change. Responsibility is the idea of having a duty or obligation to act in a certain way. The sanctity of life is a religious concept. It's the belief that life is sacred and special because it was created by God or because we are each unique individuals. Scientific then refers to knowledge based on what can be observed, such as regularities in nature and experimentation. Think about what you do in your science lessons in the science lab. And finally, stewardship, a really important key term for theme B. And this, of course, is the duty given by God to humankind to look after the created world and all life within it. And I think that would link really nicely, wouldn't it, with responsibility. So there are key terms. Now let's talk about the topics that could be on the theme B section of paper two. So our first key topic is the origins of the universe. And our key definition is the Big Bang Theory, the scientific theory about the origins of the universe. The belief that the universe began almost 14 billion years ago with a reaction of particles from a singularity, followed by a process of inflation and expansion. Expansion. Now, in terms of what this could look like on the exam, again, be prepared for a question on this from question one right through to question five. You could be asked for a question two, for example, to just give to religious beliefs about scientific views of the origins of the universe. So, you know, if you take a look at that question, you can see the exam board want you to know about this relationship between religion and science. And we could also be asked for a question four to explain two beliefs about the origins of the universe, referring, of course, to sacred writings or another source of teaching in your answer. So 
what do Muslims believe about the origin of the universe, about creation? And of course, please do draw upon your paper one knowledge here. Make that connection, make that link. We've already studied creation for paper one. Don't let that knowledge go to waste. As we know from paper one, Muslims believe God created the universe and everything within it as that omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent creator. The Quran teaches that the universe has been created in six days, and we find this in Surah 7. However, we don't have any specific information about the order in which things were created. Of course, that is in contrast to the Christian. Christian? That is the correct word? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, guys, I need some green tea. Do excuse me. That was a very strange pronunciation of Christianity. Apologies. That is in contrast to the Christian holy book um, and text Genesis, where we do find very specific details about what happened in what order on what day. And then just as an important point, most Muslims do believe the Big Bang helps understand God's creation. So they do believe in the scientific theories and they do believe it's very helpful for understanding how God created the world. Christian beliefs about creation then, Genesis 1-1 teaches that God created the heavens and the earth. So again, as that omnipotent, omnibenevolent, uh, um, omni, which word didn't I say? Omnipotent creator. Uh, there are six days of creation we read in Genesis, followed by a day of rest. On day six, a very important day, God made humans in his image, that key concept, that key doctrine of Imago Dei. Um, God's creation was very good, is another key teaching from Genesis, which links in with ideas about the value of the universe and the importance of stewardship and caring for creation. And just as an important point here, um, it was a Catholic priest who created the Big Bang Theory, George Lemaitre. Um, and also, as we've just seen, Pope Francis does support the Big Bang Theory. So again, this relationship between religion and science. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment after we've looked at some key quotes that you could use, for example, in that question for answer here. So a great key quote for this topic is from Surah 39, that God is the creator of all things. Another great quote is Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In terms of what happened on day six, Genesis 1, 26 tells us in the image of God, he created them. And we're going to come back to this quote again and again today. It's a great quote to know for your exam. Um, in the New Testament, in John, we read through him, all things were made. Um, here's a really great quote in terms of the compatibility between Islam and science. Surah 51 says we are its expander. So if you look at that Big Bang Theory definition, you see that idea. It is a process of inflation and expansion. And Surah 51 seems to be very compatible, doesn't it? It talks about God being the expander of the universe. Richard Dawkins, however, does not believe religion and science are compatible. He criticizes religion and he says religion teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. He says, you know, the Genesis account, for example, does not help us understand the world. It's a distraction. We need to outgrow it. That religion is now replaced by science. So in terms of this relationship between religion and science, which is really, really important for theme B, I want us to have a look at the Christian and Islamic responses to scientific explanations for the origins of the universe. So a fundamentalist or a literalist Christian would reject the scientific explanations such as the Big Bang Theory because they take a literal reading of Genesis. So they believe it is literally true. Every single word is literally true as the absolute infallible and inerrant word of God. So that just means that it is without error. So they believe each word in Genesis is the literal word of God and therefore it cannot be wrong. There is nothing in Genesis 1 about the Big Bang Theory. Instead, it tells us about these six days of creation followed by a day of rest. And a fundamentalist, a literalist believes that is literally word for word correct. And so so they would reject the scientific theories. However, a liberal or modernist Christian would accept the scientific theories. They would see there as being no conflict between religion and science. 
And that's because they would say Genesis is not supposed to be read literally. They would say Genesis has an important message, but it is not meant to be taken literally. So it contains an important moral truth or an important religious or spiritual truth, but it's not supposed to be a literal scientific truth. They would say Genesis is not a scientific textbook. It's a religious text and it needs to be read in that way. And so they would say the Big Bang Theory explains how the universe was created, whereas Genesis explains why. So they would see religion and science as being complementary rather than contradictory. And again, it all comes down to how you understand your holy book. Is it supposed to be word for word, exactly, literally true, or could it contain a truth? Could it contain a moral truth, for example? In terms of the Islamic responses to science then, Again, some Muslims may view the Big Bang as contradicting the Islamic creation story because the Big Bang theory appears to suggest the universe could have come into existence without God. Yeah, there is nothing in that definition there of the Big Bang theory that says and God caused it. So some Muslims may have a problem with the fact the Big Bang theory doesn't appear to require God. And that could be, you know, a problem for them in terms of accepting scientific theories, because the science seems to suggest perhaps the universe came into existence without the need for God. However, most Muslims would believe science is compatible with their religious beliefs about creation. And they would say that the Big Bang theory helps to fill in the gaps, if you like, for what is not explained in the Quran. They would say science helps them to gain a better understanding of God's creation. They can, through science, understand how God created the universe. Let's move on to our next topic then, the origins of human life. And of course, our key term for this one is evolution, the scientific theory of the development of species, which involves the process of natural selection and survival of the fittest. In terms of our exam style questions, you could have a two mark question, a question two saying to give two religious views about the origin of human life. And you could also have, of course, a question five. It is possible to accept both evolution and religious beliefs about the origins of humans. And that is a great opportunity to show off your knowledge about the relationship between religion and science. So what are the Islamic beliefs about human origins? Well, the Quran teaches that life began when God created Adam from clay. Adam and Hawa appear in the Quran as the first man and woman. Indeed, Adam is very, very important, as we know from paper one, as the first prophet in Islam. And the majority of Muslims believe that science, again, like they believe about the Big Bang, offers realistic explanations on the origins of humanity. So that evolution may be seen as part of God's plan. Again, it's how God created humanity. What about the Christian beliefs then? Well, Genesis teaches Christians that God created humans in his image. So they have a very special role as part of creation. They have a very special value. Um, God formed Adam as the first man from the dust of the ground and then he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it and of course that's a great key quote to use when you're talking about stewardship which we're going to talk about in a moment. He then created Eve as Adam's helper and that's a great link to theme A when you're talking about the roles of men and women. And many Christians believe science offers realistic explanations of the origins of humanity, the idea God used evolution. So again, the scripture tells you why God created humans to be stewards, for example, and then science explains how he did it. So the two are compatible. Let's take a look at our key quotes. And again, we've got Surah 39, which is that God is the creator of all things, and that includes humanity. Again, Genesis 1, 1, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That fantastic quote to remember from Surah 2, that God gave you life, that God has created human life. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about the sanctity of life, for example. Again, a really important quote, Genesis 1.26, the key Imago Dei quote. Genesis 2.7 says God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then man became a living being. And this is seen as the moment when God gives mankind a soul. And that's seen as very significant significant. Surah 71 says he created you stage by stage. So again, this idea, the Quran is very compatible with science. He created you stage by stage. Could that refer to the stages of evolution? In Surah 20, we then read, we have made from water every living thing, which again seems to be very, very compatible with scientific explanations for the origins of human life. 
So in terms of those scientific explanations, how do Christians respond? Well, again, our fundamentalists our literalists may reject our scientific explanations because, as we've said, they take a literal reading of Genesis. They believe it is literally true as the absolute infallible inerrant word of God. And there is nowhere in Genesis that says humanity evolved over many, many thousands, millions of years. That is not part of the Genesis narrative, and so they would reject it. However, liberalists and modernists believe there is no conflict between religion and science. Genesis has an important message, but is not meant to be taken literally. Again, it is a religious text, not a scientific textbook. So they would say evolution explains how God created humans, whereas Genesis and religion in general explains why the purpose of their lives, for example, to be good stewards. And then in terms of your Islamic responses, some Muslims may view evolution with skepticism, so they may have some doubts about about it or they may question it because the Quran teaches God created Adam from clay and again that doesn't seem to be compatible with evolution however most Muslims believe science offers a more believable explanation for the origins of human life they see evolution as part of God's plan so that Adam and Hawa narrative in the Quran or Adam and Eve in the Bible may be seen as a myth it contains a moral truth, a spiritual truth, but it's not meant to be a scientific truth. It's a different genre. It's a different category of text. By studying science, most Muslims believe we learn more about God and his creation. And so there is no conflict between science and religion. Let's take a look now then at the value of the world. And as you can see, I've put a little picture there of Laudato Si, which is a key encyclical from Pope Francis. An encyclical is a letter written by a Pope to the world's Catholics. And this particular one was written on the issue of the care for our common home. And it was all about climate change and the need to care for the environment. It's a really great source of wisdom and authority to refer to when you're talking about the value of the world. So two key terms we need to know here. We need to know stewardship, which is the duty given by God to humankind to look after the created world and all life within it. And then we also have dominion, the belief that uh, humans, excuse me, I was going to say animals then, the belief that humans have been given control and charge of the world. So in terms of our exam, how could this look? Again, be prepared for a question one right through to a question five. A question two could be to give two religious beliefs about stewardship. And a question five could be to explain two religious beliefs about stewardship with, of course, your reference to sacred writings or another source of teaching. So that could be the Bible, the Quran. It could be Laudato Si. In terms of those key beliefs then, what do Christians believe? Well, Christians believe in stewardship. The idea that God gave humans the responsibility of stewardship. They have a responsibility to take care of creation and that has been given to them by God. It's a God-given duty and so they take it very, very seriously. They also believe in dominion. This idea from Genesis, where we read that humans may rule over all the creatures, that um, God made humans to be superior to the rest of creation. However, a key, key idea in Christianity is that with dominion, there is responsibility, that stewardship and dominion come with responsibility. The world is precious, valuable and should be looked after. Christians believe that creation is amazing. It is a gift from God. It needs to be protected for future generations. And also for God, you need to treat it with respect because it is God's creation. Um, and the design argument on theme C, for example, is a great link here. The idea that the world around you reveals the existence of God. So you need to care for creation. And as I put that, this evokes what we call awe and wonder. You know, this sense of amazement, being overwhelmed by how incredible the world is, what an amazing gift. And that leads to the duty of stewardship. You want to look after it. You want to care for it. You want to thank God for it rather than ruining it and using it for your own selfish advantage. In terms of the Islamic beliefs, then we have this key idea of being a Khalifa. Again, this is very similar to the idea of stewardship. The Quran teaches humans on earth are the vicegerents the representatives of God. So it's their job to look after the world on his behalf. 
The world does not belong to humans, so they can't just use and abuse the environment in whatever way they like. They have a duty to be good stewards and care for it, to be responsible. For example, Muslims believe the world is a gift, but it ultimately belongs to God. It's on loan, for example, so you need to care for it. And of course, if we link it to life after death, you are going to be judged on how you have cared for it. So it's really important you remember you are going to be held accountable for how well you've cared for creation. And then we do also have that idea of dominion in Islam as well. The idea that humans are God's successes. So they do have this very special power, this control. They have been put in charge of the world as God's vicegerents on earth. So here are some of the quotes that underpin this and back this up. We have in the Hadiths that God has appointed you his stewards. In Surah 2, we have this really great quote, do not commit abuse on the earth. So again, this idea of having a responsibility to care for it. Um, Genesis 2.15 is a fantastic quote that God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The idea that God created humans to care for the world. A really great quote there. Um, Pope Francis, a great contemporary quote, says, let us be protectors of God's creation. He doesn't say let us exploit it. We need to protect it. We need to look after it. We need to care for it. Genesis 126 then talks about dominion, that idea that they may rule over all the creatures. Surah 35 has a great quote again on this idea of dominionship, that God has made you successes upon the earth so that you have inherited the power and the control and the responsibility. The Hadith, however, give another really important point about stewardship. The whole earth is a place of worship. And again, that links in very nicely with the design arguments. Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So the idea you have responsibility to care for it, you should not use and abuse it. It doesn't belong to you. It is God's. However, Psalm 8 says you put everything under their feet. So that could support the idea of dominionship, the idea that humans do have the power. They do have the control because God has put everything under their feet. A really important key focus for us is the issue of pollution. It's one of the APA key terms. And pollution is the contamination of an environment with harmful substances. And we need to know how a Christian responds and how a Muslim responds. So Christians could respond by remembering that humans have a God-given duty to look after the world, which is a sacred gift from God. So they would believe they are God's stewards. How does this look in action then? Well, they may try to keep pollution to a minimum. They may support environmental charities. They may recycle. They may shop sustainably. They may support environmental charities and Christian charities that work to improve the environment worldwide. So, for example, Christian Aid or A Rocha, spell A-R-O-C-H-A. And they are a really passionate Christian environmental charity. You then also have the Islamic responses to pollution. Again, Muslims have this God-given duty to be caliphs and to look after the world. So what does this look like practically? Well, they may pray for the strength to do this. They may recycle, reduce fossil fuels, avoid wasting things. Again, shop sustainably. Again, donate to those charities who are doing work around the world to tackle pollution and all of the problems associated with it. Let's move on to our first contrasting beliefs topic today then. So, you know, our focus is going to be on that contrasting beliefs question. But of course, always keep in mind, this could be a question one right through to a question five. So animal experimentation, it's the use of animals for medical research and product testing. It's really important you know the distinction between the two. The idea of testing on animals to develop life-saving drugs and vaccines and testing on animals to develop new products for makeup, hair, and beauty. Just as a little FYI, just as a little bit of trivia for you, 80 billion animals are killed for food every year, and 3 trillion fish, the poor fish, my loves, are killed for food every year as well. The average human, did you know this? I'm fascinated by this stat. The average human eats 7,000 animals in their lifetime. Can you believe that? So that just gives you an insight into the use of animals by humans. And what we're going to do as we talk through animal experimentation is we're going to build on everything we've just read about stewardship and dominion, and we're going to consider the the Christian and Islamic attitudes towards experimenting on animals. So 
In terms of an exam style question, of course, this could be the contrasting beliefs question. It could also be a question one through to five. And a potential question five could be that animal experimentation is acceptable. Evaluate this statement. And of course, you're given both sides of the argument. So what are both sides of the argument? Let me talk you through them. They're really simple. They're really straightforward. So in terms of your Christian beliefs, a Christian may agree with animal experimentation because they believe, as we've just read, that humans have dominion over creation, the idea they may rule over all the creatures. They may allow animal, animal experimentation, excuse me, for medical reasons. So, for example, drug and vaccine trials, you know, we wouldn't have uh, had a COVID vaccine without animal experiments to ensure the preservation of human life. And you can link that to St. Thomas Aquinas and the key primary precept of the preservation of life, which is very important in Christianity. And then you could also say that human life is more valuable than human life because humans have been made Imago Dei, that great quote from Genesis 1.26, the idea uh, that human life, as I say, has this special value, and so human life is more valuable than animal life. We can use animal life or we can take animal life if that will be advantageous to human beings, if that will preserve and protect human life, which is seen as more valuable and more important. In terms of the Christian reasons to disagree with animal experimentation, then you may say, well, every living thing is God's creation. And so you should avoid causing harm or killing any of God's creation. You may say that cosmetic testing is unnecessary. So whereas, you know, medical reasons may make it acceptable, cosmetic testing, you could argue, is unnecessary. You know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church for example, says it is wrong to cause animals to suffer or die needlessly. You know, should a dog, should a rat, should any animal be dying so you can have waterproof mascara? That's the kind of question you'd be asking. The idea of stewardship, of course, would come in here. The idea that humans are put on the planet to work it and take care of it. That key term, care, you know, you are to be a good steward. You must be responsible. You shouldn't be exploiting creation for your own advantage, for your own financial and personal gain, for example. Um, and this great quote here is that we are just part of God's creation. You know, the idea of dominion does not mean we are any different from the rest of creation. It means we've got a responsibility to look after creation, but we shouldn't think we're any better than the rest of creation. Because as that first bullet point says, every living thing is God's creation. In terms of your Muslim beliefs, then, you could argue in terms of reasons to agree with animal experimentation, God created animals for Muslims to use as they are beneficial to humans. You should use them to your advantage. We're going to look at a quote from the Quran that supports that in just a moment. Uh, you may say that you should allow animal experimentation for medical reasons. So again, the idea humans have this special value. They are at the top of God's creation. They have been given dominion. Their lives should be prioritized. They should therefore use animals and they can, you know, take the lives of animals if that will preserve the life of human beings. In terms terms of your reasons to disagree with animal experimentation, then you may say, and it's a great quote from Surah 6, that all creatures are communities like yourselves. So again, we are all part of God's creation. We shouldn't see ourselves as above the rest of creation. You need to have compassion and you need to recognize the value of the rest of the, you know, the creation, all of the animals, all of the creatures. Again, all creatures are created by God, and so animals should not suffer needlessly or unnecessarily. For example, cosmetic um, experiments may be seen as wrong. And stewardship, that duty to be a caliphate and care for creation rather than exploiting it for financial gain. So what are some of the key quotes and ideas that underpin these different contrasting beliefs? The Catechism of the Catholic Church has a great quote that I really love. It says, God created everything for man. So that idea of dominion, that idea that humans can use animals, for their own advantage, for their own gain, for their own survival, because God has created everything else for man to use. However, Pope Francis says, let us be protectors of God's creation. Are you protecting creation if you are killing it? 
The Hadith say that God has appointed you his steward. So again, that key idea of responsibility, remembering all creatures are created by God. Surah 40 has a great quote here about the use of animals um, to be advantageous for humanity. Surah 40 says, it is God who made for you the grazing animals upon which you ride and some of them you eat. So the idea, um, much like the quote from the catechism there, that animals exist to fulfill the needs of human beings. So they should use animals if they will be advantageous in terms of medical advances, but it could also be in terms of profits from cosmetic sales. Psalm 104 says the earth is full of your creatures. So again, the idea that all creatures are communities that we see in Islam as well, that key idea that all animals have value because they're created by God, they belong to God. We see that in Surah 6 as well, that all creatures are communities like yourselves. The Catechism of the Catholic Church again has another great quote, it is wrong to cause animals suffering or death needlessly. Now, of course, that term needlessly is a really interesting point, a great point to unpack in a question five, for example, because you say, well, yes, their death is needed to develop a COVID vaccine because of Aquinas's primary precept of preservation of life, but it's not necessarily, you know, a necessity to, as I say, test your waterproof mascara or to develop cosmetic products by killing animals. So that could be a great point to bring in contrasting beliefs about whether you can agree or you can allow animal experimentation. And then this is a great quote from St. Augustine, a really key figure in Christianity. He was speaking about animals when he said both their life and death are subject to our use. So again, it's about dominion. It's about human power over the rest of creation. And he's saying there that the lives and the deaths of animals are in the hands of humans. It is up to humans how they use and in some cases abuse animals and the rest of creation. That idea from the very first quote I've just shared that God created everything for man. So there are our contrasting beliefs. We're gonna move on now to the sanctity and quality of life. I don't know why that quote is already on the screen. Again, a few technical issues, I do apologize, but it's a great quote. It's a great quote when we're talking about the sanctity of life, the idea that God breathed into him the breath of life, the idea that God has given humans a soul. So let's talk about these key concepts, shall we? The sanctity of life, it's our religious concept. It's our belief that life is sacred and special because it was created by God. In contrast, we then have the secular concept, which is the quality of life. It's the standard of health, comfort and happiness or fulfillment experienced by a person or group. So the sanctity of life is this unconditional religious sacred idea. It's fixed, fixed, excuse me, it's unconditional. It's the idea that life has value because it's created by God. Whereas the quality of life is the idea that the value of life is subjective. Yeah. And it's subject to change. It's your personal perception of how valuable your life is, how happy you are. So we're going to look at these two key terms in terms of how they might look on the exam. You could be asked to explain two religious teachings about the sanctity of life. Of course, you might have to refer to sacred writings for question four. And you could even get a question five on this, um, a statement such as quality of life is more important than sanctity of life. And of course, then you would be weighing up the pros and cons of each and you'd be arguing which one is most important and why. I want to start with the key quotes this time. So the key quotes to share with you is the idea that God created mankind in his own image. Again, that key doctrine of Imago Dei that underpins the Christian belief in the sanctity of life. So a two, a classic, the theme B is that God gave you life. And again, that's why Muslims believe that life is sacred and um, holy because it has been created by God. The idea, do not kill, of course, in the Ten Commandments, a really important key teaching, which reflects the idea of the sanctity of life. St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, has a great quote that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So again, how sacred life is. Surah 3 is a really important quote. We're going to keep coming back to this when we talk about euthanasia. It is not possible for you to die except by permission of God at an appointed time. Surah 4 is a really strong quote to use as evidence. Do not kill yourselves or one another. Very clear there in terms of the value of life um, and the need to preserve it. Surah 7 says, whoever has killed a soul, it is as though he has murdered all of mankind. So again, the value of life, the sanctity of life. 
In terms of the sanctity of life, then, what are our key teachings? So what do Christians believe? They believe that life is a gift from God because human, humans are created by God in his own image, Imago Dei, really emphasizing how sacred human life is, that key term there, Imago Dei. Make sure you know it, make sure you use it if you can in your theme B responses. St. Paul, as we know, teaches the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, if I was an English teacher, I'd be saying, think about the connotations, Think about what the word temple represents and what it suggests. It's a holy place. It's a sacred place. It's a really precious, important place where God dwells, where God is found. It's, a, you know, a really significant thing, isn't it? Um, Christians also believe that God is sovereign over life. The idea it is God who decides when you are born and when you are die. And that leads to those teachings such as in Exodus to not kill, that it is God who is sovereign over life, that God has ownership over your life not you. Um, and so as I've put there, do not kill is one of the Ten Commandments. In terms of Islamic beliefs on the sanctity of life, then Muslims also believe life is sacred and holy because it belongs to God. They believe, like Christians, that life has unconditional worth and this should be respected and also all life should be respected. They also believe God is sovereign over life. And a great example of that is Surah 3. It is not possible for you to die except by permission of God. You have to have God's permission, so to speak, um, in order to die. He is in charge. So God chooses when life begins and how long it lasts. And of course, that has really, really profound implications for how Muslims feel about abortion and euthanasia. Life is a gift from God. And again, it's a gift that he gives. And then it's his decision when he takes it away. And then a really interesting one is that suffering is a test from God, you know, in terms of if somebody is going through a really hard illness, a terminal illness, for example, a degenerative illness, that might be seen as a test from God, if I can use that phrase. And so, you know, in terms of euthanasia, they would not be advocating euthanasia. They would say that is part of God's plan for you. And do not worry, because when you have life after death, your pain will go then. In terms of the secular concept of the quality of life, then it's, you know, a really important concept to know. It refers to the idea that the value of life is conditional. So when we're talking about the sanctity of life, we're very much talking about the unconditional value of life because it's a gift from God. Whereas with the quality of life, it's about this conditional and subjective value that you are self-assessing how much quality your life has. Are you happy? Are you enjoying it? Do you feel good? This kind of thing. So as I've put there, it's subjective and it's subject to change. You know, the quality of your life, excuse me, is going to fluctuate, isn't it? It's going to go up. It's going to go down, depending on what's happening in your life, how you're feeling, what your health is like, what your wealth is like what's going on around you. The quality of your life is going to change, you know, whether you're in science, whether you're in geography, whether you're in an RE lesson, it's going to change all the time. And so the World Health Organization definition of quality of life is that it is an individual's perception of their position in life. So again, it's very, very subjective. The big thing I have to emphasize is the contrast with sanctity of life. Sanctity of life is absolute. It's fixed. It's unchanging. Once God has given the gift of life, that's it. You know, the unconditional value of it, the unconditional worth of it is fixed. Whereas with the quality of life, it is going to change because it's your perception of your current position. If a person has low quality of life, they may feel more inclined to want to end their life, for example. And that's where we're going to link in with euthanasia. And many Christians and Muslims um, feel that how you feel is important, but it does not affect the value of your life. So they may say the quality of your life is important. You know, of course, you want people to feel they have high quality of life, that they're happy, that they're enjoying their life. But they would say that doesn't affect the value of your life. Life is always worth living. Life is always valuable, irrespective of how happy you are. And that is a really, really important thing to remember um, in terms of when we talk about euthanasia a little bit later on, but also in terms of sanctity and quality of life as concepts themselves. Yeah. The idea that Christians and Muslims believe that life has unconditional worth and value Whereas the quality of life theory, the secular theory, would suggest that that is more subject to change. It's more flexible and, it, as I say, may change over time based on your personal judgment and your personal perception of the quality of your life. 
So why is sanctity of life important? This is really important for us to know, no pun intended, for the exam. So why is it an important concept? Well, it determines how religious people feel about moral issues such as abortion and euthanasia. So it shapes their thinking and it governs their moral outlook on issues such as abortion and euthanasia. You know, it leads them to believe they are wrong because, you know, all life is sacred and special because it's created by God. So it shapes their religious beliefs about these really important issues. It means that theists, unconditionally value human life, whereas, of course, the quality of life theory suggests that the value of life can go up and down. You know, if you believe in the sanctity of life, you believe it's unconditional. The value is unconditional. And so, you know, that shapes how they approach their own lives, but also the lives of other people. And so that leads me to the third bullet point, the idea it influences how theists treat other people. For example, they don't want to cause harm. They don't want to kill anybody under any circumstances. You know, you may say because they believe life is sacred and special because it was created by God. So again, another contrasting beliefs topic now, and this is, you know, where we can start to apply many of the ideas we've already studied today from theme B. So what is abortion? It's the deliberate ending of a pregnancy. In terms of the UK law, the Abortion Act of 1967 means that you can have an abortion up to 23 weeks and six days into the pregnancy. After 24 weeks, you still can have an abortion in very limited circumstances. For example, the mother's life is at risk from continuing with the pregnancy. In order to have an abortion, two doctors are required to agree. In terms of your exam style questions, then you could get a four marker, explain two contrasting beliefs about abortion, referring, of course, to the main religious tradition of the UK as part of your answer. And uh, also a question five here, that abortion is never right. Evaluate this statement. In terms of our sources of teaching, then our sources of wisdom and authority on this. Surah 39, again, this has to be the most used quote of this video. Uh, and not just because I put it twice on the first slide, uh, <laughs> that God is the creator of all things. The idea that all life comes from God, and so it has sanctity of life. Again, there are two that God gave you life. Exodus, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Christians do not kill. The catechism then, you know, this is where we really get into some very specific quotes now. The catechism says that direct abortion is a moral evil that is contrary to the natural law. So the Catholic Church teaches that abortion is a moral evil, a really powerful word to use there, isn't it, that is contrary to the natural law. So it goes against what is natural, what is normal, what is acceptable. So is seven says, whoever has killed a soul, it is as though he has killed all mankind. And this is a really interesting conversation about ensoulment, about the point when Muslims believe the soul enters the fetus, it enters the baby within the womb. And so is abortion acceptable before ensoulment, but not afterwards? So that's a really interesting debate. Colossians, St. Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion. The idea that sometimes an abortion may be the most compassionate thing to do. The Church of England, and this is a really important distinction to know, says that there are strictly limited conditions within which an abortion can take place. So there are circumstances, there are very strictly limited conditions when an abortion may be appropriate or acceptable. However, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is very clear that human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. So from the moment that the, um, I'm trying to think of my biology now, Give me a moment, do excuse me. <laughs> when the sperm um, does something with the egg, fertilizes the egg, is that the right one? You tell me, guys, you tell me. Um, we're doing a bit of science revision now. Look at this, we're making synopsis links across the curriculum today, honestly. Um, <laughs> so the idea that at the moment of conception that human life must be um, respected and protected from that moment, you know? So an abortion is never acceptable. In terms of our contrasting beliefs, here they are. Let's break them down, let's talk through them, and let's be ready to apply them in the exam. So reasons to agree with abortion. In terms of your Christian arguments, you could refer to situation ethics, that idea from Joseph Fletcher that Christians should follow Jesus's example by doing the most loving thing in each situation. So abortion may be the most loving thing to do in certain situations, such as if the mother's life is at risk or if the child would be born with severe disabilities. So Joseph Fletcher, the pioneer of situation ethics in the 60s, said loves 
decisions are made situationally. So there may be situations when the most loving thing is to have the abortion. And so under those circumstances, an abortion would be right. A argument from compassion would be that it may be the most compassionate thing to do in certain circumstances. And our, you know, our reference there, our evidence there could be to St. Paul's letter to clothe yourselves with compassion. You need to do the most compassionate thing. You know, it's really important you show compassion. For example, the mother's life is at risk. For example, you know, the child would be born with, you know, crippling, severe, really, really painful disabilities, which would completely limit their lives, you know, and it would be the most compassionate thing to have an abortion to prevent all of that. As we've said, the Church of England says there are strictly limited conditions when it may be morally preferable to any alternative. Um, and the sanctity of the mother's life may be considered, you know, linking in with what we've just said about the sanctity of life, it may be acceptable to protect the mother's life if this is at risk as a result of continuing with the pregnancy. In terms of the Islamic arguments then, they're on the side of agreeing with abortion. I've put a really, really important key term here, the lesser of two evils. So this idea, it may be acceptable in certain circumstances as the lesser of two evils. So when you weigh up the two options, having the abortion may be the lesser of two evils. So for example, to save the mother's life again, or again, if the child would be born with severe life-limiting um, disabilities or a, you know, a really paralyzing condition that would cause them extreme amounts of pain from birth. And then we have that argument about it being prior to insolment as well, which is a really interesting debate to have based on Surah 7. The idea that it may be acceptable prior to insolment, however, there are different beliefs about when this actually is. So that is something to consider. That is something you could use. You can also use as your arguments to agree with abortion, of course, uh, secular arguments, although never forget we're doing an RE exam. So you could talk about free will, for example, you know, the idea God has given humans free will if you believe in God or just free will in general, you know, in terms of a social principle, you know, and that women should have autonomy over their own bodies, what happens with their body. You can also make an argument that life does not begin at conception, but it begins later on, you know, hence the fact that the abortions are allowed in the UK law up until 24 weeks. You know, so the acknowledgement that the life is still forming up until a certain point. And so if you have a very, very early abortion, it wouldn't be considered in Christian terms, perhaps as murder, because, you know, life has not fully begun yet. In terms of the other side of the argument, then, in terms of reasons to disagree with abortion, your Christian arguments would mainly come from the Catholic Church, who, as we've seen, are very, very, very clear in their condemnation of abortion. So the Catholic Church believes life begins at conception, and so abortion is murder. The Catechism teaches that life must be respected and protected absolutely from the point of conception. Abortion is described as a moral evil. It's seen as violating one of the Ten Commandments to not kill because life has already begun at conception. The Catholic Church therefore says abortion is murder going against one of the Ten Commandments. You could then also use the example of the sanctity of all life. The idea that the unborn baby or the fetus has sanctity of life, that because life begins at conception, the um, fetus has sanctity of life. That quote from Jeremiah chapter one says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The idea that God has created every single life with a purpose. And so you shouldn't interfere with that plan because God is sovereign and God is in charge. In terms of your Islamic arguments, again, the idea of the sanctity of all life, that God gave you life, that great quote from Surah 2, you shouldn't be interfering with this, you should be respecting this, you should be acknowledging this, and so abortion would be perhaps seen as murder, it would be seen as going against God's plan, as I've put there, it may be considered murder, so it would go against Surah 4, um, and a great quote from Surah 17 is that God will help you provide for the child, you know, Surah 17 says, do not kill your child for fear of poverty, for we shall provide for you. So the idea that that is not a sufficient justification or a sufficient reason to have an abortion, because God will help you provide for your child, will help you, you know, 
feed them, clothe them, fulfill all of their needs. So some really strong arguments there on both sides, as you can see, of that argument. A really key concept that I just want to bring in for higher level learners, so if you're aiming for that grade nine, is the doctrine of double effect. Now, this is something we see in the Catholic Church. Now, as we know, the Catholic Church are against abortion. However, the doctrine of double effect is a little bit of a loophole. So it's the idea that where an abortion is a side effect of a medical procedure to save a woman's life, it can be accepted. So if the primary purpose of the procedure is to save the mother's life, for example, in the example of an ectopic pregnancy, it can be accepted because it's for the purpose of saving the woman's life. It's for the purpose of saving the mother's life. And so if, as a result of that procedure to save the mother's life, an abortion happens, you know, the baby, the unborn baby, the fetus's life comes to an end, then that can be accepted because it is the doctrine of double effect. It is a double effect of that intervention, of that procedure, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of contemporary views as well, Pope Francis has said that priests can forgive abortions. So just in terms of contextualizing this, where the church is at now. Um, but of course, the, the current ongoing debate in America about abortion is you know, very much continuing. It's very much ongoing. And so this is a really, really relevant topic, you know, not just, of course, for our GCSE RE, but also in terms of what's going on in wider society. Let's move on to our third and final contrasting beliefs topic then, and it is euthanasia. Again, another opportunity, an even better opportunity, I think, to apply all of our knowledge about the sanctity and quality of life. So what is euthanasia? Well, it's assisting with the ending of life for a person who is terminally ill or who has a degenerative illness. So an illness that is getting worse and worse over time, it's not going to get any better. For example, Parkinson's. It's often known as assisted suicide. Now, euthanasia is not legal in the UK and so people have to travel abroad to Dignitas clinics for example um, in order to end their lives in this way. In terms of our exam style questions you could be asked again of course it's a contrasting beliefs question so you could be asked to give two contrasting beliefs about euthanasia making your reference to the main religious tradition of Great Britain and you could get a question five euthanasia is never right evaluate this statement. So what key quotes could you be bringing in if necessary to talk about euthanasia? I wanted to start with this great quote from the philosopher Nietzsche who said that one should die proudly when it is no longer possible to live proudly and that of course would support euthanasia the idea you should have the autonomy it's a secular idea Nietzsche very famously said that God is dead um, it's a secular idea and he's saying that that you should have the opportunity to die proudly to have a good death which is obviously what euthanasia means in terms of the etymology of the word when you can on your own terms you know when it is no longer possible to live proudly. So when you feel you're at a stage, it could be a degenerative illness, for example, at a stage where you are ready to die proudly or have a good death on your own terms. Luke chapter six, this is Jesus saying, be merciful as your father is merciful. Um, so you should be merciful. I've used that word too many times in one sentence there, um, towards people who are in this position, who are asking for euthanasia. You should show mercy to these people. You should show compassion to these people. Again, however, the Ten Commandments say, do not kill. You know, they are not subjective. They are not saying, do not kill unless this is the circumstance or, you know, do not kill little asterisks other than X, Y, Z. Do not kill. It's very clear. It's absolute. It's inflexible. It's unchanging. Pope John Paul II, um, a former pope, the 264th leader of the Catholic Church, said euthanasia is a grave violation of the law of God. So being very clear there about the Catholic view that euthanasia is always wrong. He said it exploits the suffering um, of people. So he is very much against, or he was very much against euthanasia, saying it goes against the law of God. So free, of course, says it is not possible for you to die except by permission of God at an appointed time. So that would suggest that euthanasia is wrong, although you could respond with a free will argument maybe. St. Paul said, clothe yourselves with compassion, linking in with that idea of being merciful. You should do the most compassionate, loving, merciful thing. 
A really great quote from Peter Saunders here, another key philosopher, he said, the right to die can so easily become a duty to die. The idea of a slippery slope as a result of euthanasia being legalized, that if we give people the right to die, it might then become a duty to die because people feel they are a burden if they keep their life going on and they need full-time care, for example. So a really, really interesting philosophical argument there. So uh, four, very, very clear, do not kill yourselves or others. So that would rule out euthanasia, would it not? And then a great quote from one of my personal favorite philosophers, John Stuart Mill, who said that over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. You know, and that obviously contradicts with the idea that we've seen in Christianity and Islam, that God is sovereign, that God is in charge. John Stuart Mill saying that in the 1800s, that you are sovereign, that you should decide what happens to your own body and your own mind. And of course, that would allow allow you to have euthanasia. So what are our reasons to agree with euthanasia? Um, the situation ethics is our key Christian idea from Joseph Fletcher, of course. It may be the most loving thing to do in certain situations. If someone's in intolerable pain, for example, they have a degenerative illness, you know, and they want to end their life on their own terms in a good way, for example. They want to uh, die proudly, as Nietzsche put it. Um, and, you know, we're linking this in with Fletcher's idea that love's decisions are made situationally you know you can't just rule out euthanasia you have to base it on the individual case that is in front of you and um, the idea that Jesus modeled love he always did the most loving thing even if it wasn't in keeping with the law so Jesus healed on the Sabbath for example and so Christians should be prepared to you know not follow the absolute laws in order to doing the mo in order to do excuse me the most loving thing Again, very similar, the argument from compassion. St. Paul wrote about the importance of compassion. You know, euthanasia may be the most compassionate option available. For example, if someone is facing increasing pain and suffering that's not going to get better, they are losing more of their functions, they are losing more of their compass mentos, they would like a pain-free death on their own terms. And so would it be the most compassionate thing to do? Secular arguments then you could link in with free will and autonomy. So what John Stuart Mill said, that over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. You should have the free will and the free choice, you know, all the way through your life as an adult. You should have that choice. It should be an option. It's your body. You should be able to choose. Of course, that's a secular argument because, you know, religious people would typically believe God is sovereign. And that leads me very nicely on to the reasons to disagree with euthanasia. So Christian arguments, you could say taking life is always wrong. Refer to the Ten Commandments, which are clear you should not kill. Do not kill. This is not situational. So a little critique of Fletch there, but universal. The sanctity of life, the idea all life is worth living and holy. It belongs to God, who is sovereign master of life. So linking in with what we've just said about the sanctity of life it is always worth living that worth as we've said is unconditional there is no consideration of the quality of life it's important but it doesn't have any effect it doesn't have any impact on the value of life even though the quality of life may be decreasing the sanctity of life remains the same you cannot um interfere with that all life is worth living and all life is holy and of course the catholic church as that very particular quote you could use says it is a grave violation of the law of God. The words of Pope John Paul II there. It is a grave violation. So it goes against God, against God's law, which of course the Christian never wants to do, and it exploits suffering. In terms of your Islamic arguments, again, taking life is always wrong, as we see in Surah 4. The idea that God decides when you die, I think that's a great quote to paraphrase if you can. It's not possible for you to die except by permission of God at an appointed time, that God decides when you're going to die. You do not. I think that's a really, really fantastic piece of evidence in terms of what Muslims believe about why euthanasia is wrong. And then again, the sanctity of life argument, linking in with that key core concept we've spoken about already that all life is holy and from God there is never a point when life is no longer worth living because it's from God it's a gift from God God is sovereign over it in terms of a secular argument then you could talk about the slippery slope Peter Saunders the right to die can so easily become a duty to die so you could say it's never right because it's a slippery slope it devalues all human life and it could lead to unintended consequences which could be very negative for example elderly people who feel like they're now a burden could end up thinking right well I need to have euthanasia then you know because 
I'm going to become a burden. I now have a duty to die. And so if you normalize euthanasia in this way and use euphemisms to talk about it, it could be a slippery slope. A fantastic little quote there from Peter Saunders. Now, another key concept that I want to just bring in very quickly is palliative care. And this is from the Catholic Church, who obviously are against euthanasia. And instead, they advocate end of life hospice care for those dying with terminal illness. And they believe you should manage your pain and relieve your symptoms through palliative care. So, you know, you would be in a hospice, for example, where you would have, you know, drugs that lessen the pain and, you know, ease your suffering. And then, you know, as you slowly naturally die, those drugs would be increased so that, you know, your pain would be numb. So it's not like the Catholic Church is saying, no, you must suffer. Although I must say Mother Teresa said that suffering is a really good thing because it brings you closer to God. Excuse me, guys, there's now a helicopter going overhead. Honestly, I am now suffering. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so, you know, it's about um end of life care where you are minimizing pain um but you're not actually bringing about intentionally the death of that person so you know you're up in the dose of painkillers and you are making sure they're comfortable um and therefore the catholic church would say euthanasia is not needed they would choose palliative care instead final topic for you now it's life after death which obviously is something we're very familiar with from paper one so you really shouldn't need to do much more than refresh your paper one knowledge and refresh your paper one memory here so in terms of life after death on theme b you could be asked a question such as to give two reasons religious believers accept there is an afterlife explain two religious beliefs about life after death uh, and obviously it could be a question Four, where you're asked to refer to sacred writings and of course a question five always be ready for a question five saying everyone should believe in the afterlife evaluate and again another great link to the religion and science conversation that we had what feels like 24 hours ago <laughs> at the beginning of this video uh, so key quotes let's do our key quotes shall we uh, john chapter 3 verse 16 said whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life which underpins the Christian belief in life after death. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that heaven is a state of supreme happiness. In terms of um, how you get there, Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goat, says the righteous will inherit eternal life. So if you live a good life, you'll have a good afterlife. Uh, Jesus, a little bit of a cryptic one, I always think, said my father's house has many rooms, suggesting it's a physical place and there's plenty of room. For people to go. Richard Dawkins is not convinced by it all. He says there is no spirit driven force. Life is just bites of information. So he says once you're dead, that's it. However, uh, Sirah 30 says that those who believed and worked righteous deeds shall be made happy. Those who have rejected the faith, however, will be punished. So again, Sirah 30, very similar to Matthew 25, in saying there is going to be reward for good conduct. A really foundational quote for Christianity here from St. Paul, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, your faith is pointless. So the whole point of the religion is that Jesus had life after death, that Jesus rose from the dead. Sarah 39 says, every soul will be paid in full the fruits of its deeds. That's a really nice quote, isn't it? Whereas the British Humanist Association is very clear. Humanists believe death is annihilation. <laughs> very clear, very to the point, isn't it? A really, really succinct soundbite for you there, that they believe death is the end. That is it. You're dead. End of the story. Good evening. Goodbye. So in terms of what are our religious beliefs about life after death? So uh, Muslims believe God has full control, as we know, over life and death. That idea God is sovereign. He decides when the world will end and people will face judgment. And that idea in uh, Surah 39 and Surah 30 there of there being accountability, that people will then be either rewarded or punished based on how they've lived this life. In terms of your Christian beliefs, then, again, um, it is about what we read in scripture. So the Bible and the Gospels teach about life after death. The emphasis, however, in Christianity is very much on Jesus's resurrection, which is seen as, you know, the key, if you like, to life after death. So as I've put there, uh, life after death is accessible to Christians thanks to the resurrection of Jesus. So really, really important. Jesus overcomes sin and death. 
Jesus teaches and demonstrates the possibility of life after death. He talks about it, about his father's house, for example, but then he also shows that he puts it into practice by being killed on the Friday and, you know, rocking up again on the Sunday saying, I'm back, roll away that stone, here I am. <laughs> and then Matthew 25 says, your earthly conduct determines your destination. So again, that idea of reward for good conduct and consequences for bad conduct. What I think is a really important area of focus, so important that you can't actually see it, do excuse me, is the impact of this belief. I think this is really important to know. The impact of belief in life after death on theists. What is the consequence of believing in life after death? So it means that life has a purpose, you know, to prepare for judgment, to live a good and moral life, follow God's commandments and his rules for life. It means theists want to make the most of their life on earth. You know, it's an opportunity to be their best, to be good stewards, for example. What a great link across theme B there, um, you know, and to do all of God's good work whilst they can. It means there is more to life than this physical existence. The life has more value, a link to the sanctity of life there. Again, another cheeky synoptic link it means they have hope that death is not the end and that justice will finally be done so it's very powerful you know it's very positive it's reassuring they may believe suffering or hardship in this life has a greater purpose so when we're talking about euthanasia you know for example that actually it shouldn't be a case of when you are suffering too much you just end your life because you could say that suffering has a purpose that is a great link by the way to theme c when we talk about arguments for the existence of god these synoptic links are flying off the shelves today i'm going to say it's all thanks to the green tea <laughs> It means they believe God is ultimately sovereign of life and death. Yeah. Again, another key concept we've referred to again and again in this video. And it means they believe this life is a gift. It's an opportunity from God. Again, another really key concept we've referred to throughout this video. Uh, just very quickly, then some non-religious people, of course, do also believe in life after death. They believe this is proven. You know, and I'm using the word proven very carefully here, considering we've started today's video talking about science and, you know, what scientists see as proof would maybe not include the paranormal, the uh, um, existence of ghosts and spirits, for example, on PIC TV, when they're going around a haunted house, going, spirits, where are you? Where's Deborah gone? Where is she? Here's Shirley. She's under the mountain. Oh, I was going to say under the mountain then. I meant to say under the mountain. <laughs> Oh, it's been a long video, guys. Honestly, if you're still watching, congratulations. You deserve a grade nine for surviving this video. Honestly, I've been serious. I'm going to write to AQA. I'll tell them your resilience and your perseverance deserves a grade nine on its own. Anyway, it could also be memories of previous lives. These people that, you know, say they can remember their previous life in Victorian England. Mm hmm. Some of them, they've had a glass of wine. Some of them genuinely do believe they have that memory. So that could be non-religious evidence about life after death. And you could also say there are logical arguments for life after death, for example, that death cannot be the end, that there needs to be justice, yeah, and maybe start to consider how would religious people respond to these non-religious pieces of evidence, you know, how would Muslims feel about this idea of um, ghosts and spirits, for example, how would Christians feel about this idea of memories of previous lives, I don't think Christians believe in reincarnation, I'm pretty sure they don't, maybe some do, um, and so, you know, how would religious people respond to those non-religious pieces of evidence, and of course, our atheists would respond to all of this by saying, it's incorrect, Richard Dawkins, life is just bites of information, there is no spirit driven force. This is it. This is the end. As our humanists tell us, death is annihilation. On that very positive note, guys, that's all you need to know for theme B. All that's left for me to say is thank you for watching. The very, very best of luck to you. I hope it goes really well for you. Good luck, best wishes, and keep living your best life. Take care and please let me know how you get on when Results Day comes around. Bye bye.